This is your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 308. Welcome to your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Well, welcome everybody. I am really pumped for this episode. We have the amazing Andrew Gotworth on for an interview where he just shared so many nuggets of wisdom and hope and motivation. I think you're going to love it. But the main point we're making today is that ERP is for everyone. Everyone can benefit from facing their fears. Everyone can benefit by reducing their compulsive behaviors. Even if you don't technically call them compulsions, you too can benefit by this practice. And Andrew reached out to me and he was really passionate about this. And of course, I was so on board that we jumped on a call right away and we got it in. And I'm so excited to share it with you. Thank you, Andrew, for sharing all your amazing wisdom. Before we head into the show, let's quickly do the I did a hard thing for the week. This one is from Christina. And they went on to say, thought of you today and you're saying it's a beautiful day to do hard things. As I went down a water slide, terrified as I'm well out of my comfort zone. This is such a great, they're saying it's on their holiday, the first time they've taken a holiday in quite a while, and it's difficult, but I'm doing it. I'm trying to lean into the discomfort. This is so good, right? I love when people share their I did a hard thing, mainly, as I say before, because it doesn't have to be what's hard for everybody can be what's hard for you. Isn't it interesting, Christina, sharing a water slide is so terrifying. Christina, P.S., I am totally with you on that. But some of the people find it thrill-seeking. And then I'm sure the things that Christina does, she might not have anxiety, but other people who love to thrill-seek find incredibly terrifying. So please don't miss that point, guys. It is such an important thing that we don't compare. If it's terrifying, it's terrifying. And you deserve a massive yay. You did a hard thing for it. So thank you, Christina. Again, quickly, let me just quickly do the review of the week and then we can sit back and relax and listen to Andrew's amazing wisdom. This one is from Sydney Tenney. And they said, incredible resource. What an incredible resource this podcast is. Thank you for sharing all of this information so freely. You're truly making a difference in so many lives, including mine. I'm also reading through your workbook and I love it. You nailed it. Marrying OCD with self-compassion. What a gift. So for those of you who don't know, I wrote a book called The Self-Compassion Workbook for OCD. If you have OCD and you want a compassionate approach to ERP, by all means, head over to Amazon or wherever you buy books and you can have the resource right there. All right, let's get over to the show. Okay, so welcome, Andrew Gotworth. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, so happy to be here. Really, uh, really excited to chat with you for a bit. Yeah, so how fun. I'm so happy you reached out and you had a message that I felt was so important to talk about. Actually, you had like lots of ideas that I, I was so excited to talk well, about. We might, I might bring some of them up because I think, anyway, it's related yeah. to, to our big topic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but the thing that I loved so much was this idea that ERP, exposure and response prevention, is for everyone. And so tell me before we get into that, like a little bit about your story and where you are right up until today and why that story is important to you. So there's a lot, uh, you know, as, as you work in the OCD field, that it takes so long between first experiencing to getting a diagnosis. And so now, with the knowledge I have now, I probably started in early childhood, uh, elementary school. I, I remember 
racing intrusive thoughts in elementary school and being stuck on things and all that. But definitely middle school, high school got worse and worse. So fast forward to freshman year of college, it was really building up. I was really having a lot of issues. I didn't know what it was and really didn't know what it was for nine, 10 years later. But I was having a really hard time in college. I was depressed. I thought I was suicidal. Uh, learning later, it's probably suicidal ideation, OCD, just putting thoughts of death and jumping off a building and jumping in a lake and getting run over and all that. But I didn't want to talk about it then. I think, you know, so a bit about me, I come from Kentucky. I count Louisville, Kentucky as the Midwest. We have a bit of an identity crisis, whether we're South, Midwest, East Coast, whatever. But still there, there's a culture that mental health is for crazy people in air quotes. Of course, we don't believe that. So my tiptoe around it was saying, I'm having trouble focusing in class. Maybe I have ADHD. And that's what I went in for. For some reason, that was more palatable for me to talk about that rather than talk about these thoughts of death and all that. And so I did an intake assessment. And thankfully, I was somewhat honest and scored high enough on the depression scale that they were like, hey, you have a problem. And so I ended up talking more. So back in 2009, freshman year of college, I got diagnosed with depression and generalized anxiety disorder, but completely missed the OCD. I think they didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. I didn't have the language to talk about it at the time because I didn't have hand washing or tapping and counting and these other things that I would maybe see on TV and stuff, which, yeah, I see you nodding. Yes, I know that's a common story. So I entered therapy in 2009 and I've been in therapy and non medication uh, ever since, but I had problems. I still had problems and I wasn't. I would make progress for a bit and then I'd just feel like I was stuck. Uh, so I ended up being in three uh, mental hospitals. One when I was doing AmeriCorps up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and had a great experience there. A couple, two, three days up there at Rogers, which I'm very grateful for. And then, you know, stabilized, moving forward. So I ended up, I dropped out of college, I dropped out of AmeriCorps, I then went back to college and Again, went to a mental hospital in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I was at Western Kentucky University. Stabilized, keep going, learning lessons along the way, learning cognitive distortions and learning talk therapy and, and all these. So let's keep fast forwarding. Another mental hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. There was a long-term outpatient stay, Skyland Trail. I'm thankful for all of these places along the way. And I wish somewhere along the way I knew about OCD and knew about ERP, our big topic for the day. So finally, gosh, I can't quite remember, I think 2018, a few years ago, still having problems. I had gone from full-time at work to part-time at work. I was just miserable. I, I would get into my cubicle and just constantly think, I'm not going to make it. I got to go home. I got to find an excuse to get out of here early. You know, I just need to say I'm sick or I got to go home or something came up. And so every day I'd have an excuse until I finally was like, I'm going to get found out that I'm not working full-time. I just, I'm going to jump the gun. I'll voluntarily go down and part-time. So that worked for a bit until OCD kept going. And then I quit again. And the, at that point, I was like, I've failed. I've quit so many things. You know, college, AmeriCorps. I was a summer camp counselor and I left early. Now this job. I need something. So I went again to, to find more help. And finally, thankfully, someone did an intake assessment came back and said, well, one problem is you have OCD. I was like, what? No, I, I don't have that. I, you know, I don't wash my hands. I'm a messy person. I'm not organized. And I, gosh, I'm so thankful for her. Yeah. I want to kiss this person. Yeah. 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 And so, but here's the, the duality of it. She diagnosed me with it. I am forever grateful. And she didn't do ERP. She didn't know it. So unbelievably thankful that I got that diagnosis changed my life and then I spent several weeks maybe a few months just doing talk therapy again and I just knew something didn't feel right but I had this new magical thing a diagnosis <laughs> and so my OCD latched onto OCD and researched the heck out of it and so I was researching 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 and really starting to find some things like oh this isn't working for me 
I've been doing the same type of therapy for a decade and I'm not making progress. So my next unbelievably thankful for is the Louisville OCD clinic. So at this point in, in this story, thanks for listening to the whole saga. No, I've got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, I'm unemployed. I have my diagnosis, but I'm not making any progress. So I go <laughs> throw this in as well. It's not really that important, but I, I go to an intensive outpatient program in Louisville before the OCD clinic. And I remember this conversation of the group therapy leader saying, I, I need you to commit to this. And I said, but I don't, I don't think this is helping me either. Because the conversation was about relationships. My relationship was great. It was about work. I wasn't working. It was about parents. My parents are great. They were supporting me financially. They're super helpful and loving and kind. It's like, I, none of this is external. I kept saying, this is internal. I have something going on inside of me. And she said, well, I want you to commit to it. I said, I'm sorry, I've, I found Louisville OCD Clinic. I'm going to try them out. So I did IOP. I did uh, 10 straight days. And it is a magical, marvelous memory of mine. I mean, as you know, the weirdest stuff. Oh, gosh. Some of the highlights uh, that are quite humorous that I had a thing around blood and veins. And so, you know, we built our hierarchy. And maybe we'll talk about this in a bit. What, you know, ERP. So built the hierarchy. I'm afraid of cutting my veins and bleeding out. So let's start with a knife on the table. And then the next day, the knife in the hand. And then the next day, the knife near my veins. And then we talked about a blood draw. And then the next day, we watched a video of a nurse talking about it. Not even the actual blood draw, but her talking about it. So of course, I'm my suds are up really high. And the nurse says in the video, OK, you need to find the juiciest, plumpiest vein. And that's where you put it in. And my therapist paused the video. She said, perfect. Andrew, I want you to go around to every person in the office and ask to feel the juiciest, plumpiest veins. Oh my gosh. Yeah, can you imagine? And so- The wording, uh, the imagery and the wording together uh, yeah. is so triggering, isn't yeah. it? Right, and she's, she's amazing. So she was hitting on two things for me. One, the blood and veins, and two, inconveniencing people. I hated to inconvenience people or have awkward moments. Well, hey, it's doing doing all three of this. Thing. So I, I went around. And of course, it's an OCD clinic. So nobody's against it. They're like, sure, here you go. This one looks big. Here, let me let me pump it up for you. And I'm like, no, I don't like this. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. such a shift from what you had been doing, right? Oh my gosh, like, it's totally it's different. Shift. It's totally yeah. different. So and I'll speed through the rest because that's that's really the the big part. But ERP over the next few years gave me my life back. I started working again. I worked full time, went part time, then full time, um, got into a leadership position. And then for a few other reasons, my wife and I decided to make a big jump abroad. And so moved to Berlin and I have a full time job here and part time disc golf coach trainer and now I'm an OCD advocate and excited to to work with you on that level. And and just like looking at where my life was four or five years ago versus now. And thanks to our big ticket item today, ERP. Right. Um, right. Oh, my heart is so <laughs> exploding for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank my you. goodness. Like, yeah. I mean, it's not a wonderful story. It's actually an incredibly... Oh, yeah painful story right it's like you can laugh at it I told it humorously no no but that's what I'm saying what that's what's so interesting about this is that it's such a painful story but how you tell it has would I be right in saying like a degree of celebration to it like oh, it, yeah. tell yeah. me a little bit about you're obviously an ERP fan, you know, mm. like, tell me a little bit about what that was like. Like, were you an immediately or were you skeptical? Like, had you read enough articles to feel oh, like yeah. you were trusting it? Like, what was that like for you? Because you'd been put through the ringer. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about, but there are a couple key moments that when you mention it. So one, we're going through the, the Y box scale, the yellow, brown, obsessive, compulsive scale, something like that. Good. So she asked me one of the questions, like, how often do you feel a, a compulsion to do something and you and you don't do the compulsion? Oh, um, never. I, I've never stopped. But you can do that. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just this moment of 
like, what do you mean? If it's if it's hot, I'm going to make it colder. If it's cold, I'm going to make it warmer. If I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to fidget. If it's I'm a problem solver. I, both my parents were math teachers. I was, I was an OLLI student and, you know, we talk about perfectionism and just right OCD, maybe in this context as well. But I also, I love puzzles. I love solving things. And that was me. I was a problem solver. It never occurred to me to not solve the problem. And so that was a huge aha moment for me. And I, I see it now and I talk about it now. Uh, to other people. But it, another part of ERP with the just right is, am I doing ERP right? Am I doing it right? Am I doing ERP right? And of course, my therapist goes, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. So we can, you know, depending on where you want to go with this, we can talk about that more. So I think in general, I hated that at the time. I was like, yeah. no, there is a right way to do it. There is. <laughs> I know there is. But now I even told someone yesterday, you know, in our sort of Instagram OCD circles, someone was posting about it. And I said exactly that, that I hated this suggestion at first, that maybe you're doing it wrong. Maybe you're not. I will say, as we talk about ERP for everyone, so someone who maybe is going to listen to this or hears us talking on Instagram and wants to do it on their own, this idea of exposing yourself to something uncomfortable and preventing the response. I don't know if this is wrong, but I will say for me, it was not helpful. In my first few weeks, I would do something like I was a little claustrophobic. So I maybe sit in the middle seat of a car. It's good. I'm doing the exposure. I'm preventing the response by staying there. I didn't get out. But in my head, I'm doing just get through this. Just get through this. I hate this. It's going to be over soon. And you'll get through it. And then you'll be better. Come on, just get through it. Oh, I hate this. Oh, oh. And then you get to the end and you go, okay, I made it through. And of course that didn't, that didn't really prevent the response that reinforced my, my dread of it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I would say that's definitely a lesson as we get into that. Yeah. Uh, well, and I think that brings me to, you bring a couple of amazing points, right? And so, and I think amazing roadblocks that we have to yeah. know about ERP. Yeah. So often I have clients who'll say, you know, early in treatment, like, you'd be so proud I did the exposure. And I'd be like, and the RP, like, did that <laughs> no. get included? Like, yeah. so I, so let's talk about that. So for you, yeah. you wanted to talk about like ERP is for everyone. So mm -hmm. where did that start from for you? Like, where did that idea come from? Yeah, I would say it's been, it's been slow going over the years where I don't know how to say this exactly, but thinking like, there must be higher than 2% of people that have OCD because I think you have it and I think you have it and I think you have it and like noticing a lot of these things. And so maybe they're not, you know, clinical level OCD. Maybe it's just anxiety or I think as I emailed you, just stress. But it's, I just wonder how many friends and family and Instagram connections have never had that aha moment that I did in my first week of IOP of, oh, I can not try to solve this. Mm -hmm. And so I see people that I, I really care about. And I joked with my wife, I said, why is it that all of our best friends are anxious people? Mm -hmm. And I think it's this, you know, that comes with this, this uh, care and attention that, and that I've suffered and I don't want anyone else to suffer. And so I see that anxiety in others. But, but getting back to, to what I see in them, so maybe someone's socially anxious. So they're avoiding a party or they're leaving early. Or, I mean, I did these two. Avoided, left early, made sure I was in either a very large group where nobody really noticed me or I was in a one-on-one -on -one where I had more control. I, I don't know. So seeing that in some other friends, leaving early, I just want to say to them, you can stay. You know, it's, it's worked for me. It really has. This, like, staying, exposing yourself to the awkwardness of staying, or maybe it's a little too loud or it's too warm. And then let that, you know, that stress peak fall and see, well, how do you feel after 30 minutes? How do you feel after an hour? And I just, you know, I, I kind of want to <laughs> scream that to my friends, you know, because it's helped me so much, right? I mean, you heard how awful and miserable it was for so long and how much better. I'm not cured. I think, you know, I'm still listening to your uh, your six-part rumination series because I think that's really what I'm working on now. So, you know, I 
I think those physical things, I've made tremendous improvement on blood and veins and all that. But that's also not why I quit work. I didn't right. quit working. I didn't quit AmeriCorps because there's so much blood everywhere. No, it's nonprofits, it's cubicles. But it was this dread that built, this dread of the day, this dread of responding to an email. Am I going to respond right? Oh, no, I'm going to get a phone call. Am I going to do that right? Am I going to mess this up? And because I didn't have that response prevention piece, all I had was the exposure piece, then it's, I can't remember who said it, but like ERP without the RP is just torture, right? Mm. You're just exposing yourself to all these miserable white things. knuckling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I, I love research. I am a scientist by heart. I'm a physics major and environmental studies master's. I love research and all this. And so I, I've looked into neuroplasticity, but I also am not an expert. So correct me if I'm wrong. But from what I hear, like, you're just reinforcing that neural pathway, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going into work and I dread it. I'm saying, I hate this. I can't wait to go home. I hate this. So that's reinforcing that for the next day. <laughs> and tomorrow mm -hmm. I go in and that dread's bigger. And the next day the dread's bigger. And so seeing that in other colleagues who are having a miserable time at work, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. But I also can see that there are parts they enjoy. They enjoy problem solving. They enjoy helping students. They enjoy the camaraderie. And so I, I want to help them with, well, let's see how we can do ERP with the things you don't like. And mm -hmm. so you're not building this dread day after day and you can, you know, do the things you value. Seems like you value us coworkers. Seems like you value helping the students. Seems like you value solving this problem and that's meaningful. But I'm watching you get more and more deteriorated at work and that's that's hard. Mm. It's hard to see that in others. Yeah. I resonate so much from a personal level mm -hmm. and I'll share why is I have these two young children who mm -hmm. Thankfully, I have a, a health, mental health degree and I have, have a license and I'm watching how anxiety is forming them, right? Like yeah. they're being formed by society and me and my husband and so forth, but I could see how anxiety is forming them. And there's so many times I've used the example before of like both my kids separately were absolutely petrified of dogs mm -hmm. and they don't have OCD. But yeah. we used a hierarchy of exposure and now they can play with the neighbor's dogs. We can have dogs yeah. sitting. Like, yeah. And it was such an important thing of like, I could have missed that and just said, you're fine. Let's never be around mm -hmm. dogs, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so it's so interesting to watch these teeny tiny little humans being formed by like, yes. oh, I'm not a dog person. Yeah. Like you are a dog person. Yeah. You're just afraid of dogs. Yeah. They're two different things. Yeah. Yeah, so that's funny that my my next door neighbor, when I was young, had a big dog. And when we're moving into the house for the very first time, very young, I don't know, four or something, it ran into the house, knocked me over, afraid of dogs for years. Mm -hmm. So same thing, worked my way up, had a friend with a cute little pup and then got to a scarier one. And also funnily to me, I'm an next door neighbor, two in a row were German and they scared me. The scary dog, German. And then the next one was the stay off my lawn. Don't let your soccer ball come over. So for years I had this like, I'm not going to root for Germany in sports. I don't like Germany. And, and then here I am living in Germany now. And so, <laughs> like an like, association. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, I think fear association, anxiety association. And then I also playing around with this idea, maybe do a, a series on Instagram or maybe another talk with someone about, is it anxiety or is it society? And so talking about things that we're made to feel shame about. So I don't know if you can see on our webcam that I have my nails painted. I would, so never, have, I would never have done this in Kentucky, right? Mm. So growing up in this, I remember vividly in elementary school, I sat with my legs crossed and someone said, that's how a girl sits. You have to sit with your foot up on your, on your leg. So I did for the rest of my life. And then I wore a shirt with colorful fish on it. And they said, oh, you can't wear that. Guys don't wear that. So I didn't. I stopped wearing that. And, and all these things, whether it's about our body shape or femininity or uh, things we enjoy that are maybe dorky or ge geeky, I just started playing Dungeons and Dragons. We have a, a campaign next week. And I remember kids getting bullied for that. And mm -hmm. so 
I, and maybe, I don't know if you agree, but I see this under the umbrella of ERP. So you're, you're exposing yourself to this potential situation where there's shame or embarrassment, or you might get picked on. Someone might still see these on the train and go, what are you, what are you doing with painted nails? And I'm going to choose to do that anyway. I still get a little, you know, a little squirmy sometimes, but, but I want to, I want to do that. And I want that for my friends and family, too. And I see it in, like you said, in little kids. A a lot of my cousins have young kids. And just overhearing boys can't wear pink or, you know, you can't be that when you grow up or, you know, just these associations where I think you can. I think you can do that. I love this so much because I think you're I think you're so right in how why ERP is for everyone. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I'll tell you a story, and then I don't want to talk about me anymore. But no, I, I want to hear it. It's fine. I had this really interesting thing happen the other day. Now I am an ERP therapist. My yes. motto is: "It's a beautiful day to do hard things." Yes. Like I talk and breathe this all day, and I have recovered from an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. But this is how I think it's so interesting how ERP can be layered too. Is mm-hmm. I consider myself fully recovered. Like Mm -hmm. I am in such good shape and I get triggered and I can recover pretty Mm -hmm. quick. But the other day, I didn't realize this was a compulsion that I am still maybe doing is I went Mm -hmm. to a spa. It was a gift that was given to me. And it says like, you know, you don't have to wear your bathing suit, Mm -hmm. right? Into the thing. So I'm like, cool, it's fine. I'm comfortable with my body. But I caught myself running (laughs) from the bathroom down into the pool, like running, like pretty quickly running until I was like, that's still learned behavior. It's still learned avoidance from something I don't even suffer from anymore. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think that that to speak to what you're saying is Mm -hmm. if we're really aware, we can, and I don't have OCD. I'm Mm -hmm. open about that. If all humans were really aware, they could catch avoidant behaviors we're doing all the time that reinforces fear, which is why exposure and response prevention is for everybody, right? Yes, yes, yes. It's so, I I feel like some people be like, oh, no, no, like I don't even have anxiety, but it's funny what you can catch in yourself that how you're running, actually literally running. (laughs) Literally running, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Away, so I, that's why I think you mentioned like how social anxiety shows up and how exposure and response prevention is important for that and, you know, daily fees, societal mm-hmm. expectations. That's why I think that's so cool. It's such a yeah. cool concept. Yeah. And so help me, since I, I do consider you the expert here, but I, I've heard clinically that ERP can be used for OCD, but also mm-hmm. eating disorder. At mm-hmm. least our clinic in Louisville served OCD, eating disorder, and PTSD. Yeah. And so I, I see the similarities there of mm-hmm the anxiety cycle, the OCD cycle yeah. for each of those. So then let's say that's sort of what ERP is proposed for. Mm-hmm. But then we also have generalized anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I think we're seeing that. I've heard Jenna Overbaum talk about that as well. Like, you know, it's the scale, right? Between mm-hmm. anxiety to high anxiety, to subclinical OCD, to clinical OCD, and that ERP is good for all of that. Yeah. Okay, so we have those. And then we get into stress and avoidant behavior. So I have this stressful meeting coming up. I'll find a way to skip it. Or I have this stressful family event. I'll find a way to avoid it. Mm. And then you get into the societal stuff. You get into these. And so I see it more and more that, yes, it is for everyone. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, clinically, I will say we understand it's helpful for phobias, health Mm -hmm. anxiety, social anxiety, generalized anxiety. Like, there's all, under the umbrella of OCD are all these other disorders. Mm-hmm. And as you said, spectrums of those disorders yeah. that it can be beneficial for. And I do think, you know, I hear actually a lot of um, other clinicians who aren't OCD specialists and so forth mm-hmm. talking about imposter syndrome or even like mm-hmm. how cancel culture has impacted us and how everybody's self-censoring and avoiding and procrastinating. And, and I keep thinking like, ERP for everybody, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. that's why I think like, again, like, even if you're not struggling with a mental illness, imposter syndrome is an avoidant, often people go procrastination is an avoidant behavior, a safety behavior. 
or self-censoring is a safety behavior or yeah. not standing up for you to a boss, you know, is yeah. is an opportunity for exposure as long as, of course, they're, you know, in an environment that's safe for them. So I agree with you. I think yeah. that it, it is so widespread an opportunity. And I think it's also, this is my opinion, but I'm actually more interested in your opinion mm. is I think ERP is also a mindset. Yeah. Like how you live your life. Are you a face your fear kind of person? Like, mm -hmm. can you become that person? Yeah. Like, that's what I, I think even in you, and actually this is a question, did your identity shift? Did you think you were a person who couldn't handle stresses and now you think you are? Or what was the identity shift that you experienced once you started ERP? Yeah, that's a good question. I've had a few identity shifts over the years. So, you know, I mentioned, and and not to be conceited, although here I am self-censoring because I don't want to come across as conceited. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so I was an OLA student in high school, and then OCD and depression hit hard. And so throughout college, freshman year, I got my first B, sophomore year, I got my first C, junior year, I got my first D. And so I, I felt like I was crawling towards graduation. And this identity of myself as club president, all a student. I had to come to terms with giving up who I thought I could be. I thought I could be, people would joke, you'll be the mayor of this town someday, Andrew, or, or that. And, and I watched that slip away and I had to change that identity. And not to say that you can't ever get that back with recovery, but what I will say is through recovery, I don't have that desire to anymore. I don't have that desire to be 100 percenter I, I'm a big fan of giving 80%. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And mayor is too much responsibility. I don't know, maybe someday. But so that changed. And then definitely through that down downturn, I thought, I can't handle this. I can't handle anxiety. I can't handle stress. People are going to find out that this image I've built of myself is someone who can't handle that. So then comes, you know, the dip coming back up ERP you know, starting to learn, I, I can maybe, but also, and you know, I love to bounce all over the place, but I think I want to return a bit to that idea that you don't have to fix it. You don't have to solve the problem. I think that was me. And that's not realizing that I was making it harder on myself, that every moment of the day, I was trying to optimize, fix, problem solve. I even, if you allow me another detour, I got on early to make sure the video chat was working, sound was okay. And I noticed in my walk over to my computer, all the things my brain wanted me to do. I call my brain Dolores after Dolores Umbridge, um, <laughs> which is very mean to me. My wife and I are like, Dolores can F off. Yeah. <laughs> but I checked my email to make sure I had the date right. Oops, no, I had the checking behavior check the time, making sure, because we're nine hours apart right now. So, oh, did I get the time difference right? I thought about bringing over an extra set of lights so you could see me better. I wanted to make sure I didn't eat right before we talked so I didn't burp on camera, made sure I had my water. And it's just all these. And if I wasn't about to meet with an OCD expert, I wouldn't have even noticed these. Yeah. I wouldn't have even noticed all of these checking, fidgeting, optimizing, best practicing but it's exhausting, right? Yeah. And so I, I'm going to maybe flip the script and ask you, how, how do you think other people that are not diagnosed with OCD, that are just dealing with anxiety and stress, can notice these situations in their life? How do they notice when, oh, I'm doing an avoidant behavior, or I'm, mm -hmm. I'm fixing something to fix my anxiety that gives me temporary relief? Because I didn't yeah. notice them for 10 years. Well, I think the question is speaks to me as a therapist, but also me as a human, right? Mm -hmm. Like I am, I catch every day how generalized anxiety wants to take me and grab me away. And yeah. so I think a huge piece of it is it's knowledge, of course, it's mm -hmm. knowledge that that, but it's a lot to do with awareness. It's so much to do with awareness. I'll give you an example. And I've spoken about this before is as soon as I'm anxious, my everything I do speeds up. I start walking faster. I start typing faster. I start talking faster. And there's no amount of exposure that will 
I think prevent me from going into that immediate behavior. So my focus is staying every day. I have my mindfulness book right next to me. It's like this thick and I look at it and I go, okay, be aware as you go into the day. And then I can work at catching as I start to speed up and speed type, you know? So I think for the person who doesn't have OCD, it is first, like you said, education. Mm -hmm. They need to be aware, how is this impacting my life? I think it's being aware of and catching it. And then the cool part, and this is the part I love the most about being a therapist, is I get to ask them, what do you want to do? Because yeah. you don't have to change it. Like I don't have this. I'm not doing any harm by typing fast. In fact, some might mm-hmm. say I'm getting more done. But mm-hmm. I don't like the way it makes me feel. Yeah. And so I get to ask myself a question. Do I want to change this behavior? Is it serving me anymore? And everyone gets to ask them that solves that question. So I think you bring up a good point, though, that I, I'm curious if you've heard this as well. So you said you're typing fast and you're feeling anxious and you don't like how that feels. I would say for me, and I can think of certain people in my life and also generally, they don't realize those are connected. Right. I didn't realize that was connected. Right. I, in college, you know, I'm wanting to drop out. I drop out of AmeriCorps. I drop out of summer camp. I'm very, very anxious and miserable. And I don't know why. Yeah. And looking back, I see it was this constant trying to fix things and being yeah. on alert. And I got to anticipate what this is going to be or else it's going to go bad. I need to prevent this or else I'm going to have an anxious conversation. I need to I need to only wear shorts in the winter because I might get hot. Oh no, what if I get hot? And it was constantly being in this scanning fear mindset of yeah. trying to avoid, trying to prevent, trying to thinking I was doing all these good things. And I saw myself as a best practice problem solver. And it's still something I'm trying to now separate between Dolores and Andrew. Andrew still loves best practices. Mm-hmm. But how, if I spend two hours looking for a best practice when I could have done it in five minutes, then maybe that was a waste. And I yep. didn't realize that was giving me that anxiety. So, yep. yeah, I guess going back to, I think of family, I think of coworkers, I think of friends that. I have a suspicion. I'm not a therapist. I can't diagnose and I'm not going to go up. I think you have this. <laughs> but, but seeing that they're coming to me and saying, I'm just, I'm exhausted. I just have so much going on. And I, I think in their head, it's, I have a lot of work. External and, problems. Yeah. When I, I may be seeing, yeah, but there's all this like tension. You're holding it in your shoulders. You're holding it here. You're typing fast and and not realizing that, oh, these are connected. Yeah. Um, yep. And so that's that awareness fun. piece. It's an awareness yeah. piece so much. And, it's, and I, it is true. I mean, I think that's what the benefit of therapy. Yes. Right. Therapists are trained to ask questions so that you can become aware of things that you weren't previously aware of. Right. And you know, if I go to therapy and sometimes even my therapist will be like, hmm, I got a question for you. And I'm like, ah, I, I missed that, you know? So yeah. I think that that's the beauty yeah. of this. I had a fun conversation. I gave um, a, a mental health talk at my school and talked about anxiety in the classroom and thanks to IOCDF for some resources there. And I had a student that wanted to do a follow up. And I thought this was very interesting. And I loved the conversation. But three or four times he was like, well, can I like read some self-help books? And then if those don't work, go to therapy. No, I think go to therapy right away. Big fan of therapists. I'm not a therapist. You need to talk to a therapist. Okay. Okay. But you know, what if I did some podcasts and then if that didn't work, then I go to therapy. Nope. Therapy is great. Go to therapy now. <laughs> <laughs> like, but should I wait till my life gets more stressful? Nope. Go now. Yep. yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because it's the it's that reflection and questioning. I, everyone who knows me knows I love questions; like they're my yeah. favorite. So I think you're on it. I think you're on it. Okay, so this is so good. I also want to be respectful of your time. Okay, so quick, round it out. Yes. Why is ERP for everybody, in your opinion? Yes. How do we how do we put this with a nice bow on it? So I it think doesn't have to be perfect. Let's make it purposely. Imperfect. Let's make it perfectly imperfect. Uh, so. We talked before about the clinical levels, OCD, 
eating disorder, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder. If you have any of those, take it from me personally, take it from you, take it from the thousands of people that said, hey, actually ERP is an evidence-based gold standard. We know it works, we've seen it work. It's helped us let it help you because we care about you and we want you to do it. And then moving down, you know, stress from work, from life. You have a big trip coming up. There's a fun scale, Holmes, Rocky, something, stress inventory. Mm -hmm. I find it very interesting that some of them are positive. Mm -hmm. Outstanding personal achievement. <laughs> yep. Like, oh, that's a stressful thing? Yeah, it can be. And yep. so noticing the stressful things in your life and saying, well, because of these stressful things, are there things I'm avoiding, things I'm getting anxious about? And, and can I learn to sit with that? And I think that mindfulness piece is so important. So whether you're clinical, whether you're subclinical, whether you have stress in your life, whether you're just avoiding something uncomfortable, slightly uncomfortable, is that keeping you from something you want to do? Is yeah. that keeping you? Of course, we, I don't know if people roll their eyes at people like us, follow your values. Talk about your values. You know, do you value spending time with your friends, but you're avoiding the social gathering? Yeah. Sounds like ERP could help right. you out with that. Yeah. Right. Are you avoiding this? You want to get a certification, but you don't think you'll get it and you don't want to spend the time. It sounds like ERP could help with that. Right. You're we're in the sports field, my wife and I, rock climbing, bouldering, disc golf. Are you you value the sport, but you're embarrassed to do poorly around your friends? Sounds like ERP can help with that. You yeah. value this thing. I, I think we have a, a solution. I, I've become uh, almost evangelical about it. Like, look at this I, thing that works so well. It's done so much for me. Love it. Okay, I'm gonna leave it that. Tell me where people can hear about you and get in touch with you and hear more about your work. Yeah, mainly through Instagram at the moment. I have a perfectly imperfect Instagram name that you might have to put down. It's just right but with right spelled wrong. So it's R-U-G-H-T. It, that is perfect. Yeah, which is... also perfectly was complete accident. It was just fat thumbs typing out my new account. <laughs> and I said, you know what, Andrew, leave it. This works. This works oh, just fine. It is so good. It is so yeah. good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm also happy um, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, my wife and I have started this cool collab where I take some of her art and some of the lessons I've learned in my 12 plus years of therapy and we kind of mix them together and try to put some lesson out so we're there. But uh, I'm currently an OCD advocate as well. You can find me on IOCDF's website or just reach out. But really excited to, to be doing this work with you. I, I really respect and admire your work and to get a little gushing embarrassed, like when I found out that I got accepted from grassroots advocate to regular advocate, I said, guys, Kimberly Quinlan is at the same level as me. <laughs> oh, I was you're, so excited. <laughs> oh, you're at so many levels above me. Just look no, at your no, story. No. That's the work, right? It's like, the uh, imposter syndrome. We talked about that yeah, earlier. Oh, yeah. For sure. No, I am just overwhelmed with joy to hear your story. And thank you. Thank you. Like, like again, I just the reason I love the interviews is I pretty much have goosebumps the entire time. <laughs> like it just is so wonderful to hear the ups and the downs and the reality yeah. and the yeah. lessons. It's so beautiful. So thank you so much. I will add then, if you allow me a little more time, that it's not it's not magic, right? I, I'm mm -hmm. we're not saying, oh, go to ERP for two days and you'll be great. Yeah. No, it's hard work. It's it's a good day to do hard things. Yes. But I think if it was if it was easy, we wouldn't be talking about it so much. Yeah. We wouldn't talk about the nuance. I mean, so I think go into it knowing it is work, but it is absolutely worth it. It's given me yeah. my life back. It's saved my relationships. It's helped me move overseas, given me this opportunity, and I'm just so thankful for it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you again. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.